Thank you for your interest in this talk. Today, I'm going to be presenting about my current research project, which involves the use of deep learning to forecast ground magnetic field perturbations at high emit latitude stations. I want to thank my collaborators and the whole magician team in both New Hampshire and Alaska as their feedback, contributions, and encouragement have been great in this early stage of the research project. Before jumping into the topic of this talk, I want to briefly mention that there are several other talks and posters from the magician team, all related to the work that is being presented here. To save time, feel free to pause the video for a closer look at the titles, presenters, and sessions. The motivation of a research project comes from the need to understand and anticipate or predict geomagnetically induced currents. GICs are, as the name indicates, currents that are induced in conductors and electrical systems as a result of disturbances in the Earth's magnetic field. Such disturbances in the field are driven by extreme solar activity, generally in association with geomagnetic storms. There is, of course, a practical aspect to GACs as enhanced currents running through conductors can reduce the lifetime and pipes and tracks by increasing corrosion, and in some extreme cases can lead to the overload of power lines and even malfunctions of the electrical distribution systems. GACs are, of course, a complex problem. Their occurrence depends on the solar wind strength, the magnetospheric response, the propagation of those disturbances through the ionosphere and into the ground, the location, this is latitude, longitude, the effect of the conductivity of the ground, and the particularities of the system being affected, including the orientation, length, among others. This talk is about one aspect of the whole GAC process. Our objective, which is the forecasting of ground magnetic field perturbations, in particular the horizontal component of the ground magnetic field. Of course, the modeling of ground magnetic field perturbations is hardly a new topic, and in fact, the research in this particular talk is inspired by the GEM modeling channel challenge that took place almost a decade ago. Purkinen et al. in 2013 offers a great starting point for any attempts at forecasting ground magnetic field perturbations as they establish a series of metrics to compare with as well as some recommendations of events to use for testing. So why machine learning? There are a good number of reasons, starting from things that we have known for a long time, such as that we're trying to make predictions over a driven system where causality is relatively well established, and the fact that historical and real-time datasets can be accessed. Naturally, the computational advances from the past years allow us to train complex models in relatively modest machines, and thanks to that, we can iterate quickly. Maybe more importantly, the availability of tools. In this case, the statement that everyone else is doing machine learning can be taken in a very positive way, as it is thanks to that that new and better algorithms have been developed, many of which can be directly applied to our kind of problem. A simple way to look at our problem is that we plan to only use measurements available at the L1 Lagrangian point to predict perturbations down the Earth. Naturally, this approach reduces in principle the opportunities to maximize the accuracy of the predictions, but allows for prediction to have a lead time of nearly half an hour, effectively creating a forecast that is half an hour ahead of time. The current project is also a continuation of a work we published earlier this year. Many details about the implementation of the model that I will be discussing can be found in our Frontiers papers. The idea remains the same, forecasting of ground magnetic field horizontal component, but instead of only using Ottawa ground stations, we'll be expanding to many mid and high latitude stations. As mentioned earlier, we are only using parameters directly measured in the solar wind. We are going to be discussing a feedforward neural network model, and we will evaluate our model as a regression problem and as a classification problem with several thresholds, as described by Purkinen et al. in 2013. For this study, we used the mid and high latitude stations first used in the GEM challenge. Out of the 13 stations, corresponding to 12 locations they used, we will be only evaluating 10 of them. This reduction is simply of technical nature. We will be paying attention in particular to the mid latitude stations marked in green and to the high latitude stations marked in purple. As datasets, we have used Omni data from 1995 through 2017. In this case, we train using IMFB, BC, 
solar wind speed, density, pressure, and electric field. The selection of parameters was done based on the findings by uh, Lutz et al. in 2015 and our own previous results. For each parameter, we decided to include the time history of the previous 40 minutes of measurements in order to have a time-dependent neural network. For the ground magnetic perturbations, we have used baseline removed supermax data. MLT and latitude have been used as training features, and from the N and E components, we have created our target parameters. We implemented a feedforward neural network using the Keras TensorFlow framework in Python. The network itself is a fully connected four layer ANN with 320 nodes in the first hidden layer and half the nodes in each subsequent layer. A dropout rate of 0.2 has been imposed between the first two hidden layers as a regularization to reduce overfitting. The train test split was a sequential 70 to 30 ratio, and the loss function we minimize is mean square error. We have considered different ways to forecast DBHDT. The simplest way is to directly calculate it from DBE, DT, and DBN, DT, and try to forecast that. Other methods involve forecasting DVEDT and DVNDT and then construct DVHDT out of the individual predicted quantities. And similar with doing N and E predictions and then obtaining DVHDT. However, we will only discuss direct DVHDT here. In addition to the training model using all the available data, we have also trained using storm time only data. And we will briefly discuss the implications of using these two different types of data sets. Although hyperparameter tuning is important to improve the model, we will only mention and briefly discuss different results associated with the choice of scalar. Finally, our validation data set will be seven storms, five out of the six originally proposed by Pukin et al., and two proposed by Welling et al. in 2018. We have excluded the 2020 three storm for the validation list, as that being the most extreme storm in record, it is unlikely that the neural network model will be able to really predict it. So to the results, the figure presents root mean square error to the left and correlation coefficient to the right of the test set for the models trained for each station, a range from lower to higher latitude from left to right. Here, training models that use all available data are shown in purple, and the models that use only storm data are shown in green. The different shaded colors indicate variations in the scalar of this model. As we don't have a baseline number to compare with and determine whether the numbers are good or bad, the main text from this figure is not to show how the RMSC is directly tied to the latitude of the station. Naturally, stations at higher latitude present larger variations in the ground magnetic field, and that shows clearly in the left panel. Moreover, by reducing the training data to storm time only, the RMSC increases for all stations, which is kind of to be expected, as we are keeping the most active times only for training. Although the left panel shows nothing more than where we can tell the physics of the system, the right panel shows that at least for the test set, there is a consistency in the correlation coefficient of the predictions across all stations and across all different models, with only a few exceptions, of course, indicating that the set of solar wind parameters used for training seems to be at least similarly good or bad across most latitudes. Now, if we move to the validation data set, that is the seven storms, we see, fortunately, a similar panorama. The root mean square error increases with latitude in general, although it does it differently for different storms. The correlation coefficient presents a similar trend than in previous figure, remaining relatively constant across stations for every individual storm, and with most storms presenting a value slightly above 0.5. In both the test and validation data sets, there seems to be a clear decrease in correlation for the higher latitude stations compared to the mid latitude stations, which may be consistent with claims that high latitude overall processes are in general local processes may be more important than the global drive of the solar wind. So what we are looking here is a single storm, the event that occurred on July 22nd, 2004, and the figure shows again 
root mean square error and correlation for all the four different models that we are comparing. What is interesting from this figure is that unlike the test data set, for the validation data set, the RMSC of the model that uses all available data and the model that uses storm time only data are now very similar, with storm time only being even lower for some stations. For correlation coefficients, storm time only presents a higher correlation coefficient. The result, while not terribly surprising, is still interesting as it reminds us how unbalanced is the original data set, with most of the time having little to no variation in the ground magnetic field, and with only few events possibly leading to GIC-like variations. So what if we look at the actual predictions for the July 22, 2004 event? The left panels show the mid-latitude stations of Wings, Newport and Ottawa, and the right panels the high-latitude stations of Avisco and Yellowknife with blue being the real data and red the predicted data. While the quality of the predictions is hard to evaluate in plots like this, the models clearly underestimate the variations of DBHDT. Still, most models seem to capture the essence of the disturbed period and reproduce some of the variability in the ground magnetic field. More importantly, as the neural network that we chose does not use the time history of the ground magnetometers, there is no fear for the model following the measurements with a delay instead of doing a real prediction, which is a common problem with recurrent neural networks. That can be clearly appreciated in the Newport station and the Yellowknife stations, where the predictions between July 27 and 28, marked between the green bars, are still consistent with the fluctuations seen in the other stations of similar latitude, even though there are no in-situ measurements. Now, a second evaluation metric described in Pulkinen et al. was the transformation of the modeling from regression to classification. This was done by considering windows of 20 minutes and registering the maximum value of DBHDT, both real and predicted, in that period of time. After that, a set of thresholds were established at 18, 42, 66, and 90 nanoteslas per minute, and the models were evaluated on whether the real values cross those thresholds or not, and of course, whether the model could predict those crossings. Figure shows exactly the same plots as in the previous slide, but transformed into the 20 minute classification problem. Note that the general fluctuations remain there, and that the transformation allows for a clear comparison. To evaluate the classification form, four metrics were used. Probability of detection, this is whether the prediction was made properly when the real data crosses the threshold, probability of false detection, when the prediction crosses a threshold and the real data don't, probability of correct, which basically shows whether real and predicted values are in the same threshold range or not, and the height skill score, which represents how much better or worse than random the model is predicting. In the case of our events, probability of detection is reasonably high for the lowest threshold at high latitude and relatively low for lower threshold. It is important to note that a lower latitude, the fact that there are very little crossings affect the score. Probability of false detection is low across the board for similar reasons, but also because the models tend to underestimate. Probability of correct essentially confirms that for this particular storm, no threshold crossings occur at the low latitude stations. And finally, the height key skill score indicates that although the predictions are not terribly good at the moment, Mid-latitudes seem to be responding better than high-latitudes, with a reasonable positive values. To summarize, we presented an overview of our current modeling of ground magnetic field perturbations at different latitudes using a feedforward neural network with time dependence built in. We evaluated our models on seven different storms and got consistent correlations in the range of 0.4 to 0.6 for most stations, although we got worse results at high latitudes. The models clearly underestimate the magnitude of the fluctuations, but in general seem to follow the correct trends, something that is encouraging. The evaluation of the model as a classification problem results in moderate but positive skill scores for the single storm presented. To finalize, we expect to present in the future a more complete analysis of the different models that we have used and comparisons with existing models which couldn't be done in the limited available time.
Thank you for your attention.